So I'm sorry, what's the M stand for? It stands for meta, but that's actually not a term that you're going to learn how to interpret until next term, so I didn't want to get into that oh, too much. Okay. It's, so this, the full name here, it's in your notes, metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. Uh, usually it's just abbreviated as MCPBA. It's important that if you saw this picture, you should say, aha, the key thing is if you see this picture, you should say, aha, this is an acid with a peroxy group, so I expect this is used for making epoxides. That's the key idea. In your notes here, you also mentioned one other per acid that he wants you to know is used for making epoxides, okay. MMPP. The structures in your notes, I won't bother putting that on the board. Anyway, you should watch out okay. for these three things for making epoxides. I didn't mention before what the starting materials are that we need for a per acid to make an epoxide, but the starting material is an alkene. I should have said that before. If we take an alkene plus a per acid, we get an epoxide. It's always important to know all the starting materials you need to get the product that you want. So this is the type of reaction that works on alkenes, carbon-carbon double bonds. If you don't already have an alkene, you have to make your starting materials into an alkene before you can treat it with the per acid. By an addition or uh, by an elimination? Elimination is the main way. E1 and E2 are the main ways that we've learned to make carbon-carbon double bonds. That's right. It's always good to think about how we can make uh, the intermediates that we might need. So the product here. would look like this. This shows how we make the epoxide. We're simply turning the double bond into a three-membered ring. Does it have to be a cycloalkene? It doesn't have to be a cyclo. It turns out that it's a little bit easier to draw the epoxide if you start with a cyclic alkene. That was a good question. So in a second, we should see how to make an epoxide out of an acyclic alkene. It turns out to be a little bit trickier to draw the geometry. Okay. So we started with a slightly easier case with the cyclic alkene, okay. but it, can, it doesn't have to be cyclic. All right. Something else to watch out for here, what's the geometry of, this al of the alkene carbons? Tetrahedral or trigonal planar? Trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. Now, when we attempt something trigonal planar, we generally get a maximum of two products. I don't know if we have had a chance to talk about that, but anytime you attack something trigonal planar, there's the potential to get a maximum of two products, because flip planar means flat. So there's the potential for the attacker to attack from one side or from the other side. For example, in this case, there's the potential for the oxygen to be added from the front or from behind. The per acid can be attacking from in front or from behind. The way I've drawn it, I've been assuming the oxygen came from in front, but it's also possible that it could have come in from behind. If it had come in from behind, then the oxygen would be behind the board. However, when we get that maximum of two products, we always have to worry about whether those are really the same or different, different things. If there's some way to rotate or flip this molecule so that it looks identical to this picture, then we don't want to think that there's really two products. Well, would you say that these two pictures are the same or different? Is there any way to rotate or flip this picture so it would look identical to this picture? Yes. Yeah, all we have to do is flip it like this. We just flip it like I'm flipping my hand. That would simply take the oxygen from behind the board to in front of the board. So even though there's the potential to get a maximum of two products when we make an epoxide, in this particular case, I should now erase this product because it's the same as this one but that's something that we should watch out for. When we're making the epoxide, there's the potential to get two different products, and you have to ask yourself whether those pictures would be different or the same. In this case, they were the same, so we really only get one product. But that always is occurring because this is going to be trigonal planar. I wanted to mention that. On the other hand, looking at your notes here, we'll, we'll see whether your instructor is emphasizing that. I think your instructor doesn't emphasize that too much. So when in doubt, maybe you'll only get the one product. But it, it's good to watch out. There might be cases where it was important to, to think about the two possible products. Right. The important thing is simply to see that alkene plus per acid gives us an epoxide. And we should also see how to do this with a acyclic alkene.
Here we have an acyclic alkene. We've memorized that this is a per acid. Mm -hmm. So we know that this is going to react with the alkene to give us an epoxide. Now I was saying that the way to draw this is more complicated when you have an acyclic alkene. So let me show you the right way to draw this. Right now, we, we were just reviewing that this is trigonal planar which means that we can draw all the bonds in the plane of the page. It's acceptable to draw all these bonds in the plane of the page so the molecule is flat like this. But it turns out that oftentimes when you're attacking an alkene, it's more convenient to rotate the alkene like this so that one of the substituents is like my thumb pointing out of the board and one of the substituents is like my pinky pointing into the board. So I'm going to rotate like this. If we rotate the alkene like this, now we would get this picture. Okay. The methyl group that used to be pointing down is now like my thumb pointing out of the page, and the methyl group that used to be like my pinky pointing up is now like my pinky pointing into the page. And there's no point in drawing these pointing up or down because now they would be pointing basically horizontally. It just turns out that this is a more convenient way to draw the starting material. I'm going to put an identity symbol here to show that these are two pictures of the same thing. This was not a reaction. Those are just two pictures of the same thing. And now we can draw Now we can draw the epoxide with the oxygen having come in, say, from above. So I've drawn the oxygen having come in from above here then. Well, if the oxygen is coming in from above, it would tend to push these two methyl groups down. But it's not going to change who's on a wedge and who's on a dash. So now this methyl group would still be on a wedge, but it would be pointing down. And this methyl group would be on a dash, and it would be pointing down. And this would be a good picture of the epoxide that we get. How is this different from when we did the acyclic, uh, when we did the cyclic epoxide? In the cyclic epoxide, we put the oxygen on the wedges of the dashes, whereas for acyclic, we put the oxygen in the plane of the page on a solid line. And therefore, in the cyclic, so in the acyclic, we're putting these substituents on the wedges and the dashes. So it's important to see the difference between these two pictures. If, you if you're forming an epoxide on a cyclic alkene, you put the oxygen on wedges or dashes. But if you're forming a epoxide on an acyclic alkene, you put the oxygen in the plane of the page. And then you put these substituents on wedges and dashes. And that's why it's convenient at the beginning to rotate the alkene so the substituents are already on wedges and dashes. So this is an important step if you're working with an acyclic alkene, this rotation to put these on wedges and dashes. Now, I've shown the oxygen coming in from above, but also, because this is planar, the oxygen could have come in from below. Then the oxygen would look like this. I'm still drawing the oxygen in the plane of the page here, not on a wedge or a dash. And now the oxygen would have pushed these substituents up. Now would give us this product. All right. Now again, we have to ask whether these are the same or different. This can be very difficult to figure out. We have to ask, is there any way we can flip or rotate this picture so we can lay it on top of this picture? This is pretty tough, but take a second and give that a shot. Does it seem like there's any way we could flip or rotate this picture so it would look identical to this one? No. Oh, that's the right answer. That's good. Most people uh, give the opposite answer. Most people think that they could just rotate like this, and then they would be the same. But if you just rotate it like this, this methyl group would be on a wedge, which is not in the right position for this group over here. It turns out there's no way to flip or rotate these. Another idea is that you might rotate it like this. Uh, but then this would go from a wedge to a dash, and it wouldn't be in the right position to lay over this. So these are really different. So this is a case where we really did get two different products. I don't want to spend too much time on that because I don't know how important your instructor thinks, thinks right. that is. But it is possible to get two different products here. Okay. 
because we can attack from either side. What is important is to compare this picture and this picture. If you're attacking a cyclic alkene, the, the epoxide oxygen ends up on wedges or dashes. But if you're attacking an acyclic alkene, you should redraw it like this, with the substituents on wedges and dashes. And then the oxygen will end up in the plane of the page, and the substituents will stay on the wedges and the dashes. So that can be important. <laughs>